Good morning. As we begin to now enter a time of worship through God's word, will you join me one more time for a word of prayer? Abba Father, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, we bow in your presence in awe of who you are. Father, we're so unworthy of your love. And yet, you give it freely. And you give it openly to all who will receive it. We thank you so much for Jesus. Scripture tells us he is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our Lord. And because he is our Lord, he is our Savior. And so, Father, we thank you for his willingness and his faithfulness to come to this earth, to grow and to set an example for us as we reached out and touched him and we saw him as he walked this earth, giving us an example of what it means to be a true child of the living God. Thank you for his sacrifice, his willingness to to lay down his life on a cross, to bleed and to die, to pay the debt I owe, the debt we owe, But Father, I also rejoice and thank you that you didn't leave him on the cross and you didn't leave him in a tomb, but with great power and great authority and great strength, he burst forth from the grave. And because he lives, we know that we may live also. And so we thank you for that. Father, we continue to be mindful of the struggles of this nation and and the nations of this world as they seem to be running from you as fast as they can. We pray for their leaders and we especially pray for our leaders. and, And Father, I especially pray for this very important upcoming year that we would be people who seek to honor you by being informed about those that are running to be our leaders, that we would seek in prayer your wisdom in making the the appropriate choice, that we wouldn't do it based on whether there's a letter behind their name, but, Father, on whether they stand on your word and your truth and live according to your standard. So, Father, guide us and guide this nation We are in so need of a revival. Father, be with those who are not with us today. Some are are missing because they are uh, struggling with physical ailments. Father, some are in rehab facilities. Others are at home. Some are in the hospital. Some are anticipating a hospital stay and upcoming surgeries. And Father, you, you know each one of them You know each situation and each need. You are the great physician. We thank you for the blessing of doctors and nurses and specialists, but we know that we need you for healing. So, Father, would you bring healing into those lives? But, Father, we also know there's other brokenness, other hurts and things that need to be healed, relationships, families, emotions, spiritual needs. Father, would you infuse each one of those lives with your presence, with your love, with your truth, and with your grace that they may come to know your presence. 
Father, for those of us that are gathered here, we too carry our own burdens, our own struggles. And you know each of those. So, Father, would you allow us, help us this day, because we at times are weak. Help us to let go of those burdens, to turn them over to you, and to walk away from them knowing that you've got them and you've got us. Just now, Father, we long to hear from you. And so we've gathered together to to look into your word and seek to understand how you would like and how you would call and how you have created us to live godly lives. So, Father, would you calm our spirits? Open the ears and the eyes of our hearts to hear and to see what you have to share. Father, cause your spirit to move in this place to interpret for each one of us the message you have for us. And Father, as your servant, would you please just set me aside now and use my voice as you speak as you speak to me as well as each one here. And so, Father, just now we invite you, please come and share with us in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, we ask. Amen. This morning, on our quest to learn more about and from Jesus, we come to the only account of Jesus' youth in all of Scripture. Yet within this short text, Jesus reveals to us how we might better live for God. And it's wrapped up in one word. We'll get to that word in just a a, a brief moment, but I believe it's wrapped up in one word and it's wrapped up in, in the evidence of Jesus himself in this text. And so I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles with you, get them out. This, the, the words will be on the slide above us, but I encourage you to read along with me as we, we read from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 39. Luke chapter 2, verse 39 reads, And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All, and all who heard him were amazed at his understandings and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And now we come to the very first words of Jesus recorded in Scripture. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. 
And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in the favor with God and man. Kay Arthur, a a winning Christian writer, as well as the co-founder of the Precept Ministries in Canada, once said this, The will of God for your life is simply that you submit yourself to him each day and say, Father, your will for me today, your pleasure for today is mine, your work for today is mine. I trust you to be God. You lead me today and I will follow. I said there was one simple word wrapped up in this text that should speak to each one of us. And that word is obedience. It's a simple word, obedience, and yet a path that we as mankind have found hard, almost impossible at times, to live out on a daily basis. Obedience is defined simply as complying with an order or law or submitting to an authority of another. Jesus himself would define obedience like this. If any of you want to be my follower, my disciple, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. Be obedient to me. I wonder if when we read passages of Scripture like this, when we don't sometimes discount, and and I'm talking about our main text as well as the words of Jesus himself, if we don't discount Jesus' humanness, For as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, Jesus was born fully man. He was born as a little baby, totally helpless. That we think things like Jesus is fully God, so he couldn't be any less than perfect. So surely Jesus never cried. Surely Jesus never got fussy with his parents because he was hungry and supper wasn't on the table yet. Surely he wouldn't do that. Surely Jesus never fell and scraped his knee. In fact, I think some people think surely Jesus was so serious because he was God that that he couldn't even laugh. Rhonda gave me a picture not long ago, showed me, of a laughing Jesus. That's the Jesus I want to serve. Why wouldn't he laugh? God created laughter. And yet, Jesus was born as a little child. I'm sure he had accidents while he was learning to potty train. He was fully human and fully dependent on people. Now, there's a reason I'm stressing all of this. Because, again, I think sometimes we focus too much on Jesus' divinity that we miss the teaching from his humanity. Now, we can't discount the the fact and the truth that Jesus was fully divine from the moment he stepped into this earth. He was God. Nothing changed that. And yet he was fully human for us. You know, there's a scientific argument on on the principle of how we turn out as adults. And, And the scientific argument is simply as this. Are we affected more by our nature or by our nurture? Are we affected more by 
the DNA that's in us, the genetics, that's the nature of us, the, the, the underlying personalities of us, or are we affected more by the nurture, the, the community around us, the, the love of, of parents, the example of parents? You, you know, the greatest joy in my life, sorry, Mom, it is, is for someone to look at me and say, you look and sound just like your father or your grandfather or your mother or your grandmother. There is no greater joy in my life. Why? Because they're the greatest people I've ever met. Now, you can all argue with me and you're all wrong. Trust me, I know. They had a big impact on my life. I stand in a pulpit today because my mother initially was the person of faith in my life. Introduced me to Jesus at birth. Took four of us to church by herself for a long time until dad started going with us. That was nurture. There, there's a part of me that is created in God's image. There's a draw to, within my nature to, to follow Jesus, but, but it was the nurture of loving grandparents and parents that insisted that you will go to church and you will do these things. Now, we want you to have a normal boy's life. And I, I think Mary and Joseph wanted that for Jesus. I think they let him go out and play and, and, and do all of that thing and hang out with the, the guys. But they also taught him the truth of Scripture. They were that example. And so I think we are who we are because of both nature and nurturing. Both are equally important in our lives, and I think we see that in the life of our Savior. And especially here in this text as he steps into that age of transition, if you will. Look at Luke 2 again with me. Verse 39, and then we're going to jump down to 41 and 42. I want you to notice the nurture that Jesus had in his life because of Mary and Joseph. Verse 39 says this, and when they had performed everything according to the law, the Torah, of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And then jump down one verse to verse uh, 41, and here's where the transition is happening. We've gone from Jesus' birth, now we're going into his, his growing up years, his beginning at the age of 12, and it says this. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Why? Because that was the law. That was the Torah. That is what God had called them to do. And then it says, and when he was 12 of age, they took him with them. They went according to the custom, the law. You see, Mary and Joseph were devout believers and followers in Yahweh. They, they were committed to, to the, the faith and to the religion of, of Judaism at the time. And their guide was the law of Moses. You see, for the children of Israel, the, the descendants of Abraham, th there was an outward sign of, of them being a part of the nation of Israel and therefore in their, in their culture and thought at that time, children of God. But it was only an outward sign, folks. It was... 
Not fun, but it, it was easy to, to have a child circumcised, but that didn't necessarily mean that they were followers of Yahweh. And I want you to know today we have the same thing. We can have people come forward and confess Jesus as Lord and go into the baptistry and be baptized according to Scripture and rise and choose not to walk in that newly created life. Choose not to walk after the way of the Lord. And if they do that, folks, that sign is not a sign of salvation. It's a sign of getting wet. It's all it is. There has to be a change in our heart. There has to be that surrender and turning our lives over to the lordship of Jesus Christ, which means we become obedient to him. I believe the greatest evidence of our devotion to God is in living daily according to his standard and not the standard of the world or any other man, but God's standard, which for Mary and Joseph was wrapped up. Everything was wrapped up in the Torah. It was God's blueprint to them as a nation, as a people, that they were to be different from the world, that they were to be holy as God is holy, different from the world to be an example to the world that they too may come to live godly lives. Mary and Joseph were devout followers of that law, but they weren't without sin. They, they weren't perfect. There were times when they probably messed up and weren't the best example for, for Jesus. And yet they strove to be all that God called them to be. They long to live in faithful obedience to God. And I believe that Jesus, in some small way, through their nurture, began to understand and learn the lesson of obedience and the importance of obedience. And I think the evidence is, is in the, the words that we didn't read there in verse 40 the second time. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and favor of God. The child grew. Why? Because he was obedient to his parents. He was obedient to the Lord. And he grew. He grew physically stronger. He grew in wisdom. And he grew in the favor of his God, his father. He is a young man that has undoubtedly learned the importance of obedience. And now as he, he begins to transition, we recognize that the role of obedience transfers slightly as well. For we see him submitting now to not only obedience to his earthly parents, but we now see the evidence of, of his obedience to his heavenly parents. Father, to that higher calling on his life. You see, at the age of 13, Jesus being 12 now, so he's right there in that area, is that time when a Jewish boy is obligated to begin to observe the law fully on his own, no longer faithful to the law because of his parents, faithful to the law because he has chosen to be a follower of of God, of Yahweh. In later years, the Jewish people would come to call those, those of that age sons of the covenant. So when it's time and, and Jesus is 12 years old, they travel together to, to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Mary and Joseph stay for the the feast, and when the feast is over and the company is ready to journey back home, they begin the journey back home. And, and sometimes we, we might give these parents a little grief because, hey, didn't you know where your son was? 
I've been guilty of saying that to some parents here recently. Uh, don't you know where your kids are? But I think we need to understand, and hopefully you're, as you, you step into Sunday school, maybe you'll, you'll dig into this a little bit deeper, but you need to understand the culture as they traveled Women and children were in the front of the, the group that would travel. And so they would go first, and the, the men would be in the back. And Jesus now is in that transition age. Not, not still a tri- child, but not 13 yet, so not quite a man. But it was acceptable for Jesus to either travel with the women at that time or with the men. So Mary likely assumed Jesus is with Joseph. He's in the company of the men. He's okay. Joseph, being accustomed to the fact that for the the last 12 years, Jesus has traveled with Mary. Well, he's with Mary. It's okay. I know where he's at. Until they stop for the night. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. They, they make a desperate search of, of the, the people they are traveling with, which are relatives and neighbors from Nazareth. No one has seen Jesus. As panicked parents would do, they immediately turn around and start back to Jerusalem. They've traveled for a day. Now it's going to take them a day to get back. On the third day, they begin to search around Jerusalem. And and you may wonder, why didn't they go to the temple first? Well, their thought was, Jesus was probably still with family and friends that lived in Jerusalem. So, So they went there first. Have you seen Jesus? And when they found him nowhere else, they go to the temple. And there they find their son, sitting at the feet of Learned men, teachers, listening and asking questions. And Mary, just like any other mother, would say, Son, what were you thinking? Don't you know what you've done to your mom and dad? We have been worried sick about you. And notice Jesus' response in Luke 2, 49 through 50 And again, I think here's where we catch that evidence of obedience. I'm reading this time from the New Living Translation. But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Jesus response here is not one of rebuke to his mother. He's, he's not being nasty and said, saying to her, Mom, you should have known this is where I would be. How dumb could you be? That's not what Jesus was saying. Instead, he was sharing with her his recognition of his higher calling, why he had come. He was reminding Mary, maybe in a, in a little bit firm way, of the words that the angel Gabriel had shared with her when he announced that she would be with child, and he will be great, and he will be called the Savior of the world, and he will suffer many things. I think he was sharing that and saying, Mother, you, you should know that I must be obedient, not only to you, but to my heavenly Father. And now there's something else I think we, we sometimes misunderstand, and that's that we use that word house. We understand the temple as being the, present, the place where God resided and his house. But the original text, nowhere, uses a Greek word that's translated house. A more literal translation is, I must be about the things of my father. I must be about the work he's called me to do. I have 
to be obedient to him. And Jesus reveals his understanding, his willingness, his desire to be obedient. And Paul would say he became obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. For that is why God sent him, to be the atoning sacrifice for you and I and the rest of the world. And yet Jesus, even in his young age, still understood that obedience was all-encompassing. That as a, as a man and as a son of Almighty God, he was required to be obedient to all of the authorities God has placed on us. And so in Luke 2, 51 through 52, we find Jesus responding and going and being obedient to the authorities of those God has placed over him in the human realm. Verse 51, and when he went down with, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive, obedient to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God. There's that evidence again of being obedient. You want to grow in your relationship to God, be obedient. You want to be effective in this world for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, be obedient. Jesus submits fully to his father. You just have to look at his entire life and, and see the evidence over and over again. And yet he also remained obedient as an example to us of the authorities God has placed over us. So Jesus returns to Nazareth fully aware of his responsibility to the world and was submissive to his parents, obedient to them, as some translations like the NIV and NLT have it. This is the truth that Jesus would model when, he confront, when he's confronted by the people about the taxes and paying taxes, you remember what Jesus said to them? Render under the authorities of the earth. Render under Caesar what is Caesar's. But under God, what is God? What is God's? A sense of obedience to both. The tax well may have been unfair. And yet Jesus said, Honor the authorities over you. Be obedient to them. And then there was the, the whole question of even worse, the, the temple tax on the Jewish people that they were required to pay. And, and recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17, we find that story that they uh, approach him at, and Peter and, and the, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, does your Lord, does your master Pay the temple tax? And Peter's reply to them very quickly was, well, yeah, of course he does. And then Jesus would ask Peter, Peter, the king, kings tax the, their own people or the people they've conquered? And Peter says, well, the people they conquered. Their own people don't have to pay taxes. Jesus replied, the people are free. In other words, they really aren't required to pay his taxes. And yet, there's an authority that calls for it. And Jesus says to Peter, however, we will not offend them. We will be respectful and obedient of them. We will not offend them. So here's what I want you to do, Peter. You go down to, the, to the, the water, and you cast a fishing line in, and you catch that first fist. And when you pull him out, you open his mouth. And when he did, he found two large silver coins. And he says, now you go pay our tax. 
Jesus was obedient to the authorities that are placed over him to a point, to a point. If those authorities should ever call upon Jesus or us to live a life that is outside the standard of God, then our obedience isn't to man, it's to God. And we only have to look to the temptations of Jesus to see that. The devil had attempted to turn Jesus away from his task and away from being obedient to his father. And three times Jesus turns him back by quoting scripture to him. And then in Luke 4, 8, we find these words. Jesus Last words to Satan in that moment. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. If they ask you to do something that is anathema against the principles and the standard of God, then we need to push back. We need to do it in love, and we need to do it in grace. But we need to push back and say, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will be obedient to him. A.W. Tozer once said, salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scriptures. Apart from obedience, there can be no salvation. For salvation without obedience is a self-contradictory impossibility. Obedience is the founding block of living a life in the kingdom of God. Obedient to the authorities who are over us, but mostly obedient, primarily and completely obedient to God the Father. Let me close with this little example and and pose a question for you to struggle with. I want you to imagine you're playing baseball with Jesus. You're the pitcher. Jesus is the catcher. It's a, a big game. Stadium is full of of people. They've come to watch you pitch. They've come to watch you play ball. When you step on the field, though, all there is for you is you and Jesus. You don't notice your teammates in that moment. Jesus takes his place behind home plate, and he, he crouches down. And he gives you that first pitch signal that he wants you to throw, and it's a fastball. You think for a moment, and then you shake it off. No, not a fastball. Jesus' next signal is a slider. This time you do look towards your teammates in the dugout for guidance. Then you glance at the fans. Again, you're not comfortable with this pitch that Jesus is asking for again. And so you wave him off. Jesus gives you a third signal. Not today. No, thank you. I'm not going to throw that one either. Then imagine Jesus silently and slowly withdrawing his signaling hand back into his mitt. There's a deep disappointment in his eyes and he decides to let you choose what pitch to throw. So you do. The batter knocks it out of the park. There's four men on base. All score and you lose the biggest game of your life. Has Jesus stopped giving you signals? 
Has he? I doubt it. My guess is Jesus is still giving signals. So maybe the better question is, are we in tune with him enough to see the signal? And are we willing to follow that signal? Is there a signal that God's been giving you that you've just ignored? No, God. I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. If that is true of you, I encourage you to spend a lot of time this week in prayer with God. Because this I know, and I mean I truly know it. If God calls you, he will prepare you. And you will succeed in whatever it is he's calling you to do. Because you are never alone. He stands with you. Always and forever. So are you missing signals? Is it time to refocus and stand in the complete obedience to your Savior. I can't answer that. Only you can. Let's pray. Abba Father, we need you. This world needs you desperately. And so Father, if we are your children and have closed our eyes to your signals, May we seek you, that you might open our eyes afresh and anew. And Father, if there's one here among us this day that doesn't know your Son as Lord and as Savior, allow your Spirit to speak to their spirit this day, in this very moment, that they may know that you love them, that you gave your life for them, and that you desire that they come to you and follow you. Father, be with us that we might be obedient to you and serve our fellow man by sharing your love, your grace, and your message of salvation and redemption that there is life, and not just for this moment, but for all eternity. We ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. We come to that time of response. We, We encourage you. Jesus stands. He's spoken to you. Have you heard? He's sending a signal. Will you answer? choice is yours. For those of you watching later online, this time of response is for you as well. If you feel the Lord has spoken to you, and I am sure that he has, we encourage you, give us a call here at the church this week. We long to share with you, to pray with you, to get to know you and build a relationship with you, and to walk with you on a path that leads to eternity. And so we invite you, would you please stand and would you respond as we prepare to meet around the Lord's table?